guide us, inform us, inspire us, break us, rebuild us as children of the living God and as members of our own families where we are desperate. God, we pray. Amen. All right, your paper has it. There's the course syllabi. And you can uh, see the weeks that are coming up here. There's a general information description there. We're going to be looking at the psychology of what's going on inside the brain of our children. And at the same time, we'll find out all sorts of things about ourselves, too. And how we are. How many are moms and dads right now in this room? You know, how many are grandparents? Maybe in addition to that. Of course in addition to that. <laughs> Great grandparents? Oh my, wow, how awesome. And anyone here that is, uh, you, you, you uh, well, well, I say anyone here, you have parents. Of course we all have parents too because you cannot be alive if you didn't have parents. So, but we are facing here something uh, that is perhaps unique in the history of the world. The statistics that we see are staggering here in America and around the Western world. One in five kids suffers from a diagnosed anxiety disorder. Anxiety is on the rise among our kids and depression, self-harm, cutting, many other mental and emotional health challenges. And part of our temptation as adults, and perhaps I should maybe think the baby boomers, older Gen Xers, I don't know, we compare sometimes to when we were kids. Remember when you were a kid? I think back in the 70s and, you know what, we went out, <laughs> we home in dark. Yeah. We tackled things. Playgrounds had metal contraptions that you see nowadays that they would, you could, you know, they would kill you. Well, we played on them all day long. And there was things where our parents said, you know, buck up, face it type of stuff. And then nowadays there seems to be this a dilemma that we are facing with our kids and despair. We, we, we like to use that term more than depression. We'll see that through the course here, but of despair in our kids and, and seeming inability to face life. There is something going on. I was talking with our foreign youth pastor, Pastor Brandon, and he was telling about the time one of the young ladies called him from the youth group and late at night and, and said, what is wrong? Tears, sobbing. And, 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 what is, oh please, what's wrong? Tell us what, and, and I gotta be in history of B and and Brandon's thinking you call me late at night for this and like what is going on pull up your big girl pants pull up your big boy pants that's ridiculous but such a response is a mistake on our part and we're going to learn this because there's something going on in the brain with our kids and young adults, and in fact, perhaps for us with social media and all these components that are part of this, that we're going to be looking at and we're going to try to understand. So, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, uses the term anxieties. And when we, t when we think of our kids and the issues, mental health of our kids, anxiety is, is a major part of it. They're little ones, and then somewhere coming up, into elementary and then up into middle school, high school, college, something starts to take over and it is it is that it's much more predominant now than it was in the past. So something is happening, like like we're drinking water in some little town that was a super fun site and the, and they're getting cancer cluster cell and it's like there's what's wrong, but only it's across our whole nation and we can't figure it out and parents don't know what to do. We're we're we don't know what to do. Because anything we use kind of in the past almost doesn't work, you know. And then we grow distant from our kids. So here the scripture tells us that we need to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. At the proper time, he may exalt you or lift you up. 
Casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. This is the first verse we're giving throughout the course of our time. And by the way, we look at a lot of psychology stuff. I'm not a psychologist, nor am I married to a psychologist. I've never acted as one on TV. I, I don't know much about it. But we will have psychologists that are here in the video series, and we're going to follow through. But this verse here is, is a key one for us, for all of us, and then for our kids. If we can somehow learn how to cast our anxieties, our cares, the despair, Depression, some some depression is, is physiological, so there's just like your eye, you need glasses for your eyes, so too some despairs that. Other is something all the more that can be cast on Christ. If we could learn that, and if we could help have the tools to teach our kids to do that, then, uh, wow, as parents, we have equipped ourselves then to see Scripture fulfilled in our kids, to cast our anxieties, our cares on Him. So Jesus, as we go forward here, we, we need you, God. And uh, we're all here. There's lots of parents. God, this room's full of older folks. They've already raised their kids. Some of them, and the kids came out great. Others, it's a mixed bag. It, and there's no, it's random order, it seems, on it. And that's the case, because everyone chooses whether they serve you or not. But even ones whose kids are just gung ho for you, Jesus, but they may suffer from despair or depression. There, there, there's things there, and, and we're trying to learn from the oldest grandparent here to the youngest. God, teach us how to cast all of our anxieties on you. That's where it should be, God. Teach us through this course, we pray in Jesus' name. I'm going to have us come, first of all, here to... Uh, an introduction of those who developed this material and they will present the beginning of this. Hey everybody, welcome to our mental health course, A Parent's Guide for Every Kid. I'm Will Hutcherson. And I'm Dr. Chinway Williams and we are your guides to help you navigate the scary, complex, an often confusing world of kids' mental health. But before we get into all of that, let's first introduce ourselves. Ladies first. Why, thank you, Will. I'm a board-certified licensed professional counselor, and I've spent 18 years helping educators, leaders, and parents just like you support kids who are struggling with depression, anxiety, despair, and trauma. And she also has a whole alphabet of letters after her name, but... You know, and a powerful job description for sure. I'm sure you've seen so much of your, as your time as a counselor. More than I can even possibly begin to describe. Now tell us about you, Will. Well, I've been a youth pastor for the last 15 years, so I've seen a lot. And let me tell you, I am really passionate about sharing hope to kids and teens who are suffering from anxiety and depression. I founded a nonprofit called Curate Hope, and we work in public schools all across America. We partner with parents and educators to provide practical solutions to respond to kids who have depression and sometimes suicidal thoughts. Will and I's work, and specifically this course and our book scene, stems from a passion to equip parents and caring adults as they help kids and teens who are hurting. So currently, one in five kids suffer from an anxiety disorder. So anxiety is on the rise amongst our kids, but so is depression and self-harm and a host of other mental and emotional health challenges. You know, when you think about that, it's no wonder our kids have been having such a hard time in school and life in general. Uh, world events aside, the inner world of a kid's mind has the power to shape everything. And they've been going through a lot socially, academically, and even psychologically. That's right. Learning your kid is struggling with their mental health can be one of the most difficult challenges you face as a parent. And even as a parent myself, I find it really hard to understand my kid's experience and respond in a caring and supportive way 100% of the time. And I know a lot of the parents I counsel feel the exact same way. I know I feel that way. I mean, as a dad, 
I don't always feel equipped to handle everything that my kid is facing on a daily basis. And if I can be honest, at times it feels a bit overwhelming, right? It is overwhelming. And that's why we're so excited about this course, because we want to offer you some hope. And as parents to the next generation, we have the power to make a big difference in a kid or a teenager's life who's hurting on an emotional and mental level. So research tells us that one of the best predictors for success for any kid is having at least one consistent, supported, and caring adult in their lives. Now, if we're really honest, I think we can all agree, though, that parental guilt and shame are real things. And our goal with this course is to not pile on additional guilt. We want you to walk away from this course feeling empowered and confident, giving you the tools that you need to connect with your kid with intention, especially if you have a kid who's experiencing high levels of anxiety or despair. Because you know what your kid needs most in this moment? They need you. And they need to be handled with care and loads of grace. Woo. Don't we all need a lot of grace right now? So let's get down to it. In this course, we're gonna help you understand the psychology of what's going on in your kid's brain, especially if they're experiencing depression or despair or any other mental health challenge. Yeah, and that's right. As parents, we all have the best intentions, right? I mean, I've never met a parent that doesn't love their kid. Every parent loves their kid. In this course, you'll learn why some of the things that we say and do, even with the best intentions, don't always work and can sometimes make things worse. Then you'll learn five science-backed and super practical tools to connect and support a kid who's struggling with mental health issues. And we're gonna teach you how to recognize when your kid might be in need of support and where exactly to find that support. And most of all, Dr. Chinway and I want you to know that there is always hope. In fact, say that with me right now. There is always, always hope. hope. That felt good to say, right? It sure did. Now, here's the thing. Mental health discussions often have stigmas attached to them. And to be honest, you've probably heard or maybe even embraced some of those beliefs that keep the stigmas going. So it's important to remember just a few things. Number one, God made our brains. Amen. Number two, mental health is no different from any other form of physical health, like eye health or heart health or dental health. So these are all parts of our bodies that need our attention and sometimes the help of a doctor or support from anyone around us. So the brain is an organ of our bodies just as much as our heart, our eyes, and our teeth. Those are really good points, Dr. Chinway. And the third thing that we want to point out is this. Having mental health challenges doesn't indicate a lack of faith. Neither are the practical steps that we take towards improving mental health like therapy, maybe medication, or even self-care. Think of it this way. If you have a heart problem, you may pray about it and ask God for healing, but you're also going to see your doctor and you're maybe take your blood pressure medicine and seek treatment. The brain is no different. We can pray for our healing for our kids' mental health while taking practical steps that influence healing. And that's why this course matters. We know how important it is to lean in early if our kids are showing signs of anxiety or depression. Regardless, if left unchecked, anxiety and depression can spiral and become debilitating and actually lead to desperation or even hopelessness. In fact, the teenage years in particular are an especially critical time. That's when suicidal thoughts and behaviors have been known to increase. And there are some of you who are watching this. And maybe you're afraid that your kid may want to hurt themselves right now. And if that's you, I urge you to ask them directly about it right now. I, I promise you won't be planting an idea in their head that's not already there. Now, you might be wondering, well, what if they give me a vague answer or if they don't answer at all? If you're having a hard time getting through to your kid, do me a favor right now. Take a deep breath, pause this session, and head over to video 11 right now for some conversation prompts and additional help. And if your kid has already expressed self-harm or expressed thoughts of suicide, it's important for you to stay calm but act fast. You need professional help. Call your kid's pediatrician or primary care physician to walk you through some next steps. 
And if you're in a crisis situation and you're in the United States, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 988 or text the crisis text line by texting TALK 741-741 to speak or text with a trained counselor. And if you're afraid your kid is in immediate danger to themselves or others, call 911. Our world has changed in really significant ways. And while our kids may seem like they're in their own worlds, they're actually absorbing everything going on around them. So your best line of defense starts right at home. And as your guides, we're gonna help you meet your kid right where they are. And we're gonna give you the tools that you need to support them through any mental health challenge they may be facing. So as we journey together, make sure you download our workbook from the site where you're currently watching. And most importantly, let's open our minds to learn as we seek to understand our kids' hearts and minds together. So, a couple things to note here. One is, uh, as we look at psychology and all these type of things, you all understand this past right here. We believe in Jesus. Amen. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the one who heals us. Jesus can heal the brain of any one of our kids. Jesus is the answer. We all know that. And, and I want you not anyone to walk away thinking, man, we're sure getting a lot of psychological stuff. Well, because our brains and psychology are a critical part of who we are. And so we are going to look at this and we are going to see the resources that are out there. These are Christ followers here on, on the video and it's going to help us. We're going to walk forward together and I believe it's going to be tools that can be very helpful. Second thing is this, I mentioned about it and they said pause, go to, we're going to go all through this for the course here. But I want you all to know this, that our youth pastor, Pastor Josh, Pastor Ryan, our children's pastor, they, they are and will always, if any of our kids ever express about thoughts of suicide, or even if they're self-harming in some way, they're, they're, they will approach you as parents. Okay? We will never have a situation where, well, the kid talked about suicide and, and we tried to work it out with them. I want you all to understand that. You are the primary caregiver. You're the one who has a right to know that. Plus, you're the one that's going to be part of it. You're the answer. They were saying, of course, Christ through you. You're the answer with that child because you've had the most time with them, the most relationship with them. All right? So, since 2007, suicide rates have increased 76% for ages 15 to 19. Suicide rates have nearly doubled in teen girls. And by the way, they, they've linked it to some studies to Instagram and this just depressive push of, of their self-worth that happens with girls more than boys. Which, by the way, don't go home tonight and delete the Instagram account. That's not the problem. There's a path, a path to take with with your teenage girls, with your with your youth. With, let's listen all the way through this course and it'll equip us. Uh, so highest rate of increase, so catch this, the highest rate of increase among all ages is in kids between 10 years old and 14. Can you imagine a 10 year old? Depressive system, sy symptoms are up 21% in boys and up 50% in girls. In early 2020, an estimated one out of four young adults contemplated suicide. And we, we think, well, that must be inner city. That's the east and west coast. Like it, it is, you all understand this. Let's wake up and open our eyes. It is all around us. It's in our very families. It is our young people. It's our young adults. Down to 10 years of age, perhaps even younger that are dealing with this so we are going to address it all right so i want you to turn and talk with at your table i'm going to give you a minute and 32 seconds so what if, what do you think about these stats talk about what do you think about these statistics what do they what do they mean go ahead and talk with your group starting up we have here books that uh starting next week we will sell you as part of these two individuals on the video. They wrote this. It's called Seen. 
Our kids need to know that they are seen, they feel invisible. And, the, and this could be a good tool for you if you want. It's $15, we're actually at the church going to underwrite. If you want, it's $10. And starting next week, we'll sell those. If we run out, we'll, uh, we'll order some more and so forth. You'll hear a little bit about that. But when we talk about our, our kids, those, as, as we're older, there's this frustration in trying to deal with them. How many of you parents ever felt frustrated trying to deal with your teenager? Yeah, and it just, it is like, what is going on? And the example I gave earlier where we want to almost say that is just ridiculous, but we can't say that. We're gonna learn these tools here that we have to listen and pull up your big boy pants. While it is true, by the way, it is true. You can't say it. There is a process we have to do. We have to lead our child, whatever age that is, we have to walk them down that path. Because this this new day and age, something with social media and all the world and culture, what's happened here, they're not gritty, they're not resilient. And we and we can we can try to blame them. I mean, they deal with our teenagers down into elementary are dealing with for instance pornography things that I didn't have to deal with the only way I could ever get pornography if I had even known about it which I didn't even know what that word would have meant was if if I found a magazine somewhere which never found magazines around it there was it just wasn't around I couldn't I, I dodged that bullet my generation dodged that because it just is was not available it is available to our kids and and it is it is everywhere. You, you could use the 90 percentile up for those who would have in some way struggle or it, it's an issue for these kids. And now that's a further tool of the enemy to just depress and to, and, to, and to cause that sense of self-worth and the despair. It just grows from that. So we need to be able to listen. We need to be able to hear them. We'll get these tools. No, right now, up front, we will fail. Everyone else is parents. We will fail. I fail my wife. She comes home and wants to tell me about work, and I'm like, I want to solve it for her. I want to just tell me what's wrong. I'll get on the phone right now. And you know how that goes over like a lead balloon with Rob or whatever. Well, we try to do that then with, with our kids. There is a process that we're going to have to take them through. So there's an answer we're going to discover in this course. Listen to this. It's, you can fill this in here. The brain does predict, predictable things when it experiences despair. We know this. The brain will do predictable things. Our youth pastor, our children's pastor, they, they have seen this time and again. They deal with hundreds of kids, hundreds of youth. And a Pastor Garrett with the young adults, there are predictable things the brain does when it experiences despair. And also, the brain does predictable things when it experiences love, when it experiences care and community. So there's where we want it to be. There, that's the direction we want to take it here. Let's listen to our friends on the video. Hey everyone, welcome back to our mental health course, A Parent's Guide for Every Kid. Before we dive in, let's recap. In our last video, we talked about a few of the big things our kids and teens are facing that are impacting their mental health, like anxiety, depression, and self-harm. That's right, and as parents and caregivers, we know that our kids are dealing with some heavy stuff. And as you walk with your kid through these hard things, you might have this little nagging voice in the back of your mind asking, did I cause this? This is absolutely a common concern. I can't tell you how many parents will have asked me what they could have done differently. Yeah. But the truth is, what I found is that mental health doesn't discriminate. It affects all families of all backgrounds, regardless of race or religion. And parents often feel guilty when they learn that their child is struggling. And here's what you need to know right off the bat. None of this is your fault. Did you hear that, parents? Straight from the doctor herself, there's your RX right there. Let yourself off the hook because should we, you say it, I believe it. Well, thank you, Will. You're welcome, yeah. But all kidding aside, let's be clear again. For all of our parents or caregivers who are feeling guilt, it's not your fault. 
You can raise a child in a healthy home environment, meet all of their basic and not so basic needs, and still discover that your child has a mental health challenge. Exactly. While a child's most important relationships can both shape mental wellness and exacerbate a mental health concern, you didn't cause this issue. I want to be emphatic here. You are not at fault for your child's mental health condition. However, you are a big part of what helps them to begin to heal. So every parent and caregiver out there, let's take a big deep breath and let that guilt go. It's not your fault. But here's the good news. You can be a big part of the healing. Yes, this is hard stuff. But we're here to tell you that there is always hope. So how do we go about being part of that healing? Well, we know it's easier said than done. Because more often than not, when a child is struggling with their mental health, the entire family is impacted. This is so true, Will. If you've walked with any kid through depression or anxiety for any length of time, you know this. After a period of showing really good patience and understanding, it's easy to lose patience and maybe even slip into frustration. So you're not always going to have all the answers. You are going to make some mistakes. So it's super important to offer yourself compassion. Remember, you are doing the best that you can, and there's so many things that may be outside of your control. And never forget that you are the most important resource that your child has to help them to heal. And it's important that you care for your own mental health as you care for your child's. Experiencing your own anxiety, grief, or depression may inadvertently impact how you interact with your child. For instance, if you're walking through a mental health crisis with one of your children, along with the demands of your work life, your energy may be completely spent when it comes to interacting with your other kids or your spouse or your friends. So Dr. Chinway, what should parents do in that situation? So this is actually one of my favorite things to talk to families about. So when stress hits, this is the time to up your self-care. And as a parent myself, I understand how impractical self-care can seem, especially in the midst of a crisis, but it's so needed. So here are some of my favorite strategies to de-stress that may be helpful to you. So sometimes I find that I need to take several deep breaths just to sort of clear my head. For you, you might find taking a short walk, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, that might actually be really helpful. And for other people, just grabbing a journal and jotting down their thoughts and their feelings that have been kind of creeping in. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. Oh, I love that. And if it's helpful for you, Will, maybe it's going to be helpful for someone that's listening. So another strategy that you can try is talking to a trusted friend or even a professional if needed. So we're going to discuss even more super practical strategies in video four. So as we close this section of the course, we want you to reflect on a few questions. Don't worry about writing the questions down. They're going to be in the digital workbook that was provided with the course. Question number one, what are some of the biggest misconceptions I've had about parenting through mental health? Mm, that's a good one. Question number two, what areas of parental guilt am I holding on to? And the last question, what steps do I need to take to prioritize my own mental health? These are great questions and ones that we want you to really think through before continuing on with the course. So we've all heard the saying that you can't pour from an empty cup. And the same is true here. So in order to be the best resource for your child's mental health, we want you to prioritize your own. Once you've taken a few moments to answer the questions, Dr. Chen Wei will meet you in video three to do a deep dive on stigma, brain science, and healing. Thanks for watching, parents. You're doing a great job. And we will be looking at that at our tables in just a moment, but let me tell you here, as parents here, uh, we all have feelings of guilt about our kids and how we raise them, and, it, and we can't help but operate from that sense. But we all need to take a deep breath, like you said. Every, every child makes decisions. What we need to be doing right now is making sure that we're doing everything we can to help them. So I think about my son Brian as a, a, a you know a malfunction of the brain for Brian, and um, autism, and learning disability, and as he was growing up, here I had Brandon and Matthew, and the things that I was trying to do and did 
very well with Brandon and Matthew. Both of them as Sims God ministers, they're serving the Lord. It's and I'm, 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 I rejoice in that. Man, it did not work with Brian. And I would try to, I had my same toolkit that I used with Brian. So with Brandon, I'd say, excuse me, that is not how we speak to our little brothers. You say it kindly. You want to be treated kindly too, right? Robin taught me all this, by the way. Robin, amazing as a parent. And then, and then Brandon, and, and there was this, well, I couldn't do it with, with Brian. And I tried to be strict. And I did, and, and with Brian, through the 18 years that Brian was in our home, he, when he turned 18, he went to independent supported living. And it was heaven and it was hell. We, there was one day, one night, it was so terrible that I told Robin that with tears, he said, we need him institutionalized, Cox North. You know, the something that he needs to be five, a week, five days or something put in and their neurologists look at him and they can study him and all that type of stuff. And I called in the morning, we're gonna do this. In the morning I called my brother Terry, he's in California, so I called about seven in the morning, it's five in the morning for him, you know. And he, and he went, what are you calling a five for? It's 5 a.m. here, don't you know that? And I go, we're going to put institutionalized Brian or whatever. And then, of course, my big brother, Terry, he started crying. I'm so sorry, to you know how he, how he said it. But, man, it was terrible. I, I called around to some of the doctors and nurses of the, of the church here, and they said, hey, you know, you need to know this. A team of neurologists are not going to study Brian. If you send him to Cox North, they will put him in a rubber room and medicate him so that he's just comatose almost, and then give you a little break, and then he'll be back in your hands. And, and by the time the sun rose, you know, it was a new day, you know how that is, another day came, and things were a little better, and, and I didn't take that step, we didn't. But it was indicative of, I just, my toolkit was missing. Now, over the years, I watched Robin, and then I started to learn how to deal with Brian, and how to redirect him, and how to get past, and, and, and you know, things are good with Brian. Brian, you down in the front row and stuff that he sits with me here at church and, and, and I'm loving it. And I feel like I've grown. And then we move into mom and dad's home to take care of dad. And dad is becoming like a child. And I find some of the same things I was doing with Brian, I start to do with dad, my dad. I put him in a wheelchair. And he has a little place for his feet to sit on, those little, you know, places. And, and, he, and he pulls his feet up. I go, Dad, you know what? We're trying to get there, Dad. Put your feet back up. Put your feet back up. And Robin's coming up and he's saying, Ted, he doesn't know what he's doing. Here I'm talking to my daddy. And being mean to him, he doesn't. And I find that I say, God, help me to, to be Christ. Not only to my sons, but then to even my dad. And I'm learning, Christ in me is starting to grow. I'm 58 and I'm starting to become like Jesus. And every one of us, we want to be that. We want to find the tools that will help us. And so as we go through this, I'm really hoping these Wednesday nights that we will be vulnerable with one another. And the church in America, we're not really vulnerable. We all have our own homes and we, we, we are so careful around everyone else to, to act like we have our act together. That's a little harsh, but allow me, please. I hope we will be vulnerable here and that we, if need be, even will open up to others that are at our table. And that if we're struggling with depression ourselves or thoughts of suicide, boy, no better place you could say it and share it than be right here. And by the way, if someone does love them at your table, gather around them, be, be kind to one another, be Christ to one another, if we're struggling with those type of issues, or our kid is, our kid is, then let's share it with one another. We're a family, so we got to lift each other up. And remember, you're the most important resource in your kid's healing process. You are it. It's not the school, it's not the counselor at school, they, they can be helpful, whatever, but you are the one. So these are tools we want to have. Let's work it. Let's make sure that we, that we make ourselves available. There is a verse here I want to have us look at. But first, 
I forgot. We are having our questions here that we will answer. And so these are mentioned in the video at your table in your group. I want you to answer these questions, talk about them one with another. What are some of the biggest misconceptions you've had about mental health? As far as you know, as far as you understand, what are some of the mis biggest misconceptions you've had about mental health as it relates to Christian parenting? Okay, at your tables, talk. I'll give you a 20 second warning when we'll move to the next question. Go. This also is one of our key verses throughout this whole course. And as a parent, our kids are not resilient. Our, meaning our church family, America's kids, they're not resilient. They, they, they struggle with despair, self-harm. They, 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 they can't express that. Have you ever tried to deal with your child or a teenager? And it's like, what's wrong? And they can't even express what it is. There's just an inability, actually. And it's not that they're trying to be mean to you. They're not. They don't want to be mean to you. They're their parents. They love you no matter what relationship you have with them. But they literally, and we'll be seeing this, they're struggling from one side of the brain to the other to express and give expression to what they're feeling inside. That's why some of these tools are going to be a circle, a word circle, that they can actually start picking off their, what they're feeling and you will guide them to actually express what's inside. But as parents... We have to be willing to be vulnerable in that ourselves. If our kids are, are resilient, if James chapter 1 comes true, and their steadfastness and perseverance, the word we used a little earlier was gritty, that they can become gritty. They become gritty, they can handle things. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Is that if, you know, this, this kids that seemingly can't face life, that you would actually as a parent lead them, and somewhere along the line as they come up close to time to go to college and they become gritty and they and resilient and they go off to college and instead of it being that they are just a tsunami upon them they no longer have you they're off they actually are gritty as how did it go well you know the other like girls in my quad they 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 ostracize me oh i'm so sorry it's okay i found some friends over and, and it's like oh my goodness who is this child they're becoming gritty. They, they develop perseverance. And it comes through Christ. So let's help them to become gritty. That means long conversations or awkward conversations. And it's a process because we parents will fail in trying to do that. We are going to fail. But then through those failures, permission to fail, all of us, we start hitting it. And God can do the miracle through the Holy Spirit to us. So there is hope. Guess what? I'm being nicer to my dad. <laughs> and I get to put him to bed at almost every night. Tim and Tom help too and stuff. But I put him to bed and I'm nice. Let me help you, Dad. <laughs> and, it, and, and it's Christ in me. And by the way, it's the most wonderful thing in the world. I get to put him up and I have this lifting. <clears throat> lift him up, go to the toilet, all those type of things. And then to put him in his bed, lift his legs up onto the bed. And the whole time, man, it's a dream come true for me. Because dad and I say, I love you, son. I love you, dad. How many times? 20 times a day, whatever. I get a habit, and it's all mine. And I put him to bed, and then I say, dad, will you pray for him? Oh, and then he starts praying, half in Spanish, half in English. He calls me Terry, calls me Tim. All this stuff. It's okay, man. And I just, I just, I lay there, or I stand there next to him, and I have my hand right on on his body, I'm patting his shoulder as he's laying there. And I say, Jesus, I receive it. Every prayer here, this patriarch, it's a blessing upon me. I receive it, oh God. And it's so cool. And then he's done that, and I pray over him, and that's so wonderful. And I say, I'm going to kiss your cheek real loud, because he had a cochlear implant and all this stuff. Goes, I'm going to kiss your cheek. And I give him a kiss. Every night I kiss my dad. Good night. Some of you have maybe never kissed your dad. That's not your privilege to do that. It's a lot, man. Not to kiss your dad, but to kiss my dad. <laughs> God has been merciful to me because I, I, I had to learn a lot. And so we're going to do this together. There is hope. Here's what I want you to do now. We're going to close by this at your tables. And by the way, thank you for those who share. Wow. And as we go along, this is what we're going to do. We've got to be 
going with one another. But we're going to close in prayer at your tables. So you pray for one another. And, and, say, and, and someone lead, and then and several others can pray too. You don't have to go all the way around, although if everyone wants to, that's very fine. But you're going to pray, and, and just when you feel like you're concluding, then you can conclude. But then be respectful of others, and maybe they're still praying. But we need one another. So this is the moment where we become the church family, the body of Christ. Body of Christ. The hand can't say to the arm or the foot, I, I, we don't need you. But this is your time. Pray for another. And if you want to, right before everyone prays, you may... Go ahead and take the risk and just say, whatever it may be, I'm suffering depression myself, or I'm dealing with this, so that you can pray for them. Will you do that? I love you all so very much. Pray, and God bless you once you're done.